Did you buy Avengers Tower? <laughs> Alakwa, first of all, I have to say I saw the first three episodes of Echo, and they're they're fantastic. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you saying that. Of course. Uh, the show comes out swinging right out of the gate. They toss you into this incredible action sequence. One of those continuous, gritty shots. I would love to hear. It's also, we can see it's you in a lot of sequences. The camera really has you in there. It's not all stunt double work. I would love to hear about the training that went into it, the choreography you had to learn to really bring this incredible fighting ability that Maya has to life. Yeah. I wish I can say I did all the stunt work, but... Seriously, I I did do a lot of stunt training for pre, in the pre-production and that helped as well. Having a stunt double as well. She was great. But I didn't they didn't want me, the stunt coordinator leader didn't want me to do all of the stunts. And I totally understand because we don't want, you know, any injuries happening and hold up production. That would be tragic. But Having the stunt team was so fun to work with, and I was able to learn the new choreography and the fights, new stuff every single day. And I wasn't used to it, of course, but it looked great in the film. And then, you know, some days we learned choreography on the day of, but it was so fun and challenging. But overall, it was a fun, tiring experience doing stunt work. Oh, well, it was worth it because it is incredible. It looks awesome. Uh, so thank you for the work you did. Uh, we also get to see Maya kind of tap into these new powers that we didn't see in Hawkeye. And they're a little bit different from the comics, uh, new stuff for the MCU. And it looks, it's really cool to see them developing on screen. I'd love to hear how this power set we're going to see Maya uh, get to evolve throughout the Echo series. Like, how was it presented to you? How do you interpret uh, what she's doing, how she's relying on the cultural history as well as a part of that power? Obviously, this is different from the comic books. And I'm just really proud that to have an Indigenous director and Indigenous people behind the camera as well to be to be able to help make that culturally superhero power accurate and represented and it's a definite different superpower than we're used to seeing so i'm proud of that and i think it'll be very unique and special for the audience to see oh it's cool uh maya and kingpin that's going to be an interesting reunion after how things left off in Hawkeye. Uh, what can you tease about this relationship when it comes back into play? Because there is such a long history between the two. So obviously from Hawkeye, Echoes and Kingpin's relationship went downhill. Catastrophe happened because Maya found out what Kingpin did kingpin did to her father and it was terrible of course so i'm excited for the audience to see the relationship has just become so much more intense and complicated and i want to know their reactions i want them to react to the chaos oh yeah we're oh we're gonna react don't you worry uh and so we're gonna see my and kingpin we see my and daredevil in the trailer uh this is a spotlight series which they're doing as kind of a standalone but it's still part of the marvel cinematic universe so given the opportunity who from the mcu would you really love a chance to do scenes or other projects with oh i get that question a lot but the simple answer is spider-man <laughs> yes uh that's a great answer we we all love spider-man now okay now i, I like to talk and in, tap into maya's psyche real quick because in the show we see Ma maya is she doesn't really let people in and she's very reserved emotionally until she's not so i would love to hear from your perspective how does maya handle these relationships and how has the kind of trauma she's experienced impacted that because we really get to dive into it i find it to be one of the most interesting uh, parts of echo i think it's very impactful because she did have a lot of trauma growing up kingpin forced her to become a fighter and 
all of those bad things that she was it did and he did in New York. So she's very untrustworthy of everybody. She, you know, she doesn't want to say anything to anybody or else something somebody will get back to their her uncle and she doesn't want that relation to be to be ruined but she also has this other relationship with her blood family so she's trying to figure out how to make this connection because this whole time she did not grow up with them so she's struggling to make that connection with them but i'm very proud of her for being able to try and make that connection and bring those barriers down and connect with her biological family and her chola yes now i'm curious as a performer do you learn anything when you go on a journey like that with a character? Do you find yourself applying sort of the lessons that Maya as Echo goes through to your own personal life in any way? Do you take anything with you? Uh, not in a bad way, but she has a lot of traumatic things that happened to her. So I don't love, you know, growing up, I had surgeries all of my childhood. So she has her own trauma and I have my own trauma as well from childhood. So we've gone through a lot of stuff and, you know, because I do have a prosthetic leg. So I've had those surgeries as I was growing up, but that makes me feel resilient and a warrior. And I feel very similar that we have those traits together. So their trauma has made us have similar traits. Amazing. Now, last question real quick. Which episode are you most looking forward to everybody seeing? Um, probably episode. I haven't watched four and five yet myself, to be honest, but I think I saw episode three and I would have to say episode three is my favorite so far. The fight scenes oh, are great in the skate rink. Great. So good. Thank you so much for the time. And I can't wait to see all of Echo myself. Of course. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks Thank for having me. Vincent, how are you, man? Good, man. Hi. It's good to see you. Uh, I saw these first three episodes. Kingpin coming back is always a treat. It's always a little bit terrifying. Uh, and I love to start with that because uh, a reunion between Maya and Wilson is not something I think is going to be very pleasant after we saw uh, the their last meeting in Hawkeye. Can you tease a little bit about what it might be like to see Kingpin and, and Maya come face to face in Echo again? Yeah, it's a little rocky. <laughs> yeah, it's a little, uh, rocky. a little rocky. Yeah, things happen. Things are said. <laughs> you know, it's a it's a very intense relationship. The um, this kind of father daughter, um, and, and kind of father daughter relationship, and her wanting to 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 move on, and um, and then her getting closer to her family, and then. She gets more con connected to her her native ancestral history, and um, it's uh, yeah, uh, Fisk is not happy about it. Yeah, and he, he's also a character that uh, if you're on his good side, you're really on his good side. If you're on his bad side, you're really on his bad side. But he really he has a way of caring about people at the same time. As scary as he is, he has a way of caring about people that's really true and real. Uh, is that like how did how did you balance that? Because Maya is a character that Wilson has a deep you know affection for through for, through so many years. Yeah, I mean, I I actually think it's the most interesting way to 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 do this character to present this character because he's such a he can be such a monster. But I think if we always depict him as having an intense emotional life as well, just like people do in real life I think that always makes the character more interesting the fact that he can turn on a dime if he needs to and that's I think that makes him more dangerous and more scary yeah you you have a way of flipping a switch and becoming kingpin and it, it, I think one way it really comes through is you have a voice that you perform as kingpin and I'd love to hear how you found the sound of kingpin because you have a presence that goes right down through the way you talk as this character yeah, it's uh, I'm, yeah, it's interesting that it's uh, that you noticed. Um, yeah, so uh, the way I work is um, when it comes to intense things like that, um, I use events in my own life that happened in the past, and um, that's how I found the voice of of him early on for the Netflix series. It's um, a, an emotional event event that happened in my life and. And through the that pain comes, be, I, I I kind of 
formed that voice. And so, so now when he's speaking, it always has a very kind of uh, uh, fragile and, and sometimes um, uh, visceral kind of dangerous feel to it. Yeah, uh, it's incredible. It's incredible work because nobody else could play this part like you do. And I'm excited to see what you do in Echo. And I know you're you're already at work on Daredevil: Born Again. And you've kind of talked about what you got new writers and directors. You're kind of revisiting a few things about Daredevil just to make the show better. I love to hear if you can talk about anything about how was it tonal stuff? Is it story stuff? What kind of new stuff are you guys trying with this kind of new direction you're taking in the Daredevil series? Well, I really can't say much, as you know, but I I, I will say that. Um, I will say this, I'll say that while I was shooting Echo, um, I realized um, it confirmed a lot for me, which was is that even if people have never seen the, the original Daredevil, the tone of Echo and the writing in Echo allowed me to present the character to even a new audience, not just audiences that seen Daredevil before, in the way that I think he's best portrayed. I think in that tone, he's best portrayed like that. And 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 we're gonna continue that. I can't wait to see it, man. So I'm gonna end it with this because this is a theory I talk about probably more than anybody else in the world. It's it's one I've been wanting to know. And your character comes up as the answer to it for, for many years now. Did you buy Avengers Tower? <laughs> I can't answer any of those questions. It's, nobody's ever asked me that, though. I'm surprised you're actually, now that you've asked, you're the first person who's ever asked me that. I, I ask everybody who's a candidate for years now, and I, Brad just told me I'm going to find out who bought it. So I'm like, all right, one of these days, one of these days. <laughs> it's, it's always an absolute pleasure to talk to you, man. Thank you so much. Congratulations on more incredible work uh, as, as Kingpin, and I cannot wait to see where you take this character. Thanks, dude. I appreciate it. Brad, good to see you again. How are you, man? Thank I'm you so great. much for last night. That was Thank awesome. Thank you for having me. And congrats on the reception to all the news you, uh, you just I quietly know. dropped there. I what? know, I know. We'll talk about that I first. learned from the best. You know, I came up <laughs> under Kevin Feige. He always left the room with one more thing, and yesterday was no different. That's that little credit scene with Marvel. You stay till the end no Is matter what. stay till the end? Of course. But let's talk about Echo first. Yeah. Uh, Echo is launching under the Spotlight banner, which yeah. is the first Marvel Studios project under that banner. I'd love to hear about the Spotlight banner, kind of where you see this going in the future and why Echo is the perfect project to do it first. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's kind of like the comics in that um, there are certain stories that tie into the continuity and um, really play into the overall narrative, and there's other ones that, 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 that are more standalone and, 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 and are, are character-driven like Echo is. So um, really what the Spotlight branding represents is an opportunity for people who are more casual fans who might not know you know, what happened in the last Avengers movie to show up and kind of enjoy it on its own, on its own terms. Yeah, it, it does a good job of catching people up too. This, I saw the first three episodes. I thought they were really good. Thank you. Uh, it, it's also the first TVMA project from Marvel yep. Studios. Why was Echo the perfect project to dive into more adult-oriented, mature content? Well, you know, we didn't set out to make a TVMA show. We set out to make a Maya Lopez show. And she's a character with a, with a, with a violent past um, who lives in an ethically gray area. And, um, and like Sidney Freeland, our, our, our EPN director said, it's an unapologetic show. Um, and we just let Maya lead the journey and that turned into a, a TVMA experience. And that comes with characters who were previously under TVMA banners coming into this with Daredevil and Kingpin, who we saw in the trailers. I'm not ruining anything. Yep. But I want to start with Daredevil. First, Charlie Cox comes in. We have him in a Daredevil suit, which is in the trailer. It's awesome. I'd love to hear about what Charlie Cox brought to this, having years of experience with the character and expertise. What kind of stuff did he bring to elevate uh, his work as Daredevil and Echo as a whole? Uh, one, of my, my, one, of my, one of my favorite things about, uh, about uh, the Daredevil um, scene in the show is how it defines New York. And, you know, not to spoil things, but, you know, as we move forward into the future of the MCU and we start telling more grounded New York-based stories mm -hmm. like Daredevil Born Again, um, Daredevil himself as a, as, a, as a symbol of vigilantism in that, in that, in that city, as a symbol of, 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 of what it means to be um, operating in the criminal underworld in New York, it's just so impactful. Uh, and Charlie 
is Daredevil. You can't you can't really separate mm-hmm. the two now. Yeah. And he he um, even in that scene, he he really. Um, I mean, he he just you just want to know more. You want to lean in. It's the it's the greatest it's the greatest hook in the world for our for our future moving forward. You mentioned New York. I got a question I've been dying to have answered for like I think seven years now. Am I ever gonna know who bought Avengers Tower? <laughs> uh, Brandon, I'm just gonna honestly, yes, yes, you will. I can't wait. Oh my gosh, I I, I <laughs> have my theories, and it's part of the fun. It's part of the fun. You, I, what, let's talk about some of the news you dropped at the What If conference as well. You're you're in charge of Marvel streaming animation, uh, and I love like Eyes of Wakanda. Somehow you made that was a surprise. We Best kept secret. Like completely a secret. Yep. Uh, I'd love to hear about that project. Is that the Wakanda project that we kind of knew there was a Wakanda project? But we didn't know it was an animated show. Yeah, it's um, it's a it's a show we're producing in partnership with Proximity Media, which with with Ryan Coogler as one of our executive producers. Um, the show was brought to us by Todd Harris, who was a longtime storyboard artist at the company, just like Brian Andrews was, who was the director of What If. And he pitched the show to Ryan, and he pitched the show to Kevin and I, and we were like, "Let's do it." And it's a, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's. I don't want to say too much about it, um, only that uh, uh, it, 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 people do not see it coming. We really did. And so I'll end with this because last night we saw so much awesome stuff that's coming in 2024. We're kicking off the year with Echo, uh, Marvel Studios, and TV and streaming has shifted the schedule quite a bit going forward. I'd love to hear about how you guys are kind of learning from the past couple of years and all the stuff you've done and how you're applying that to what's coming in the coming years. That's a, such a great question. Um, we've learned a lot. Um, we've, we've produced a lot of content very quickly and we're a, um, primarily a, 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 a filmmaking company. So you can see that the, 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 our, our first round of shows have a very, um, uh, a movie-like structure. They arc out the characters by the end. They feel like standalone limited series. Moving forward, our content is going to feel a lot more like television. That kind of drives towards the horizon, drives towards the future, um, can, can keep people engaged for longer periods of time in a more lean back setting of your living room to set it apart, frankly, from the big cinematic event experiences in the movie theater. Awesome. I can't wait to see it. Uh, Sydney, I got to see the first three episodes of Echo, and I thought it was awesome. So I just had to start with a compliment to you. Oh, thanks, thanks. Of course. It, 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 it's like this, totally, for me, it felt like this combination of like Sons of Anarchy meets Daredevil in, in the Marvel Universe with... I, I, so I would just love to hear from you. Was there anything you looked at that tonally you thought could, was kind of an inspiration for Echo? Yeah, you know, I think... Um... <sighs> Well, it, first and foremost, everything stemmed from the story, right? Mm-hmm. So we knew we were going to tell something that was um, a little bit on the street level, grittier, edgier side. Um, and you know, one of the things that initially attracted me to the project was the fact that she was a villain, and um, uh, and and so that all roads sort of led to and from that. And then I think as we progressed, and we we started looking a lot of in terms of specific inspiration, it was it was a lot of. Uh, action films that use a lot of stuff in camera. You know, I think um, uh, I'm trying to think of specific influences. Uh, Atomic Blonde was 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 a big one. John Wick, um, uh, Lady Vengeance. Um, you know, and then the, just purely from an action standpoint. And uh-huh. I think even, but then even something like Mad Max Fury Road. You know, they did so much stuff in camera. Yeah. Um, and we we did our our, our uh, we were our, our darndest to like uh, uh, sniff those those. Uh, uh, projects. A pretty good job, I have to say. Uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned like Atomic Blonde and John Wick. Those 87-11 stunt team uh, movies are incredible. And this show comes out swinging with an incredible action scene that honestly reminded me of like the Daredevil shows on Netflix, where you have those kind of continuous shots. They're gritty. They're incredibly well choreographed. Uh, I mean, there is one sequence. I didn't. I should have figured out how many minutes it was. You probably know better than me. But it's a continuous shot. It's incredible. I was hear about how much, how many days goes into one action <laughs> sequence like that. How do you pull that off? I, I believe it's six. I think it's six minutes. Um, it's uh, and. Um, I think with something like that, it was you know so we have a we have an action scene in the first episode that's a six minute oneer, and yeah. um, uh, you know I think it's it was it was ambitious and we knew that going in but I think the thing that jumped out to me on the page is that um, what I loved about the scene is that from a story standpoint, Maya Lopez comes into that scene as a teenage girl and she leaves that scene as a cold blooded killer 
Mm-hmm. And we internally, we sort of talked about this as the birth of a villain. And, and so for me, I always, I wanted, I wanted to see that transformation happen in real time. Um, and that's what sort of lent itself to the Warner um, uh, aspect. And in talking about it with my stunt coordinator, Mark Skizak, you know, we, we went back and forth because it's like, oh man, you know, um, we have a TV schedule. And what makes those films like like something like Atomic Blonde, like there's a great one or fight sequence um, uh, in that film. I think they had 10 weeks of rehearsal. <sighs> we didn't have anything remotely close to that. And so we knew it was ambitious going in, but we decided like, hey, let's take a big swing and um, let's go for it. Yeah, <laughs> you hit it out of the park. Incredible work. Uh, you mentioned in both those answers, the story is the, obviously the biggest component here. You could have all the action, you could have all the style. It is it comes down to story, and this show is coming down to character to drive those stories. Maya, you and she's a villain. Uh, in what ways do you think she's a villain? Because I see she's kind of bringing war to a place that doesn't want it, things like that. Is it because she's putting people she loves in danger by doing that? Is it kind of the fact that she's willing to kill to survive or accomplish goals? Or what, what are the ways that you think she uh, is a villain? Yeah, you know, it's, I think that was what initially attracted me to the project, you know, is the fact that in Hawkeye, you know, she's she's a sort of a top ranking lieutenant in Kingpin's army. Mm-hmm. And um, and so on paper, that transformation of seeing how does a young uh, deaf indigenous girl from New York, or from Oklahoma end up being a top ranking lieutenant in Kingpin's army. Uh, and Kingpin is a criminal uh, mastermind, you know, and, and, and it's usually, the, it's not usually the tops of the organization that do the dirty work, it's the lieutenants and it's the people on the street level. So for my Lopez, in order to elevate to, the, to those lofty ranks of, of being, you know, just under Kingpin, you have to have done something dirty. Yeah. Uh, you have to have uh, made certain sacrifices to get there. And so that was, that was always the most exciting part. Oh yeah, and Kingpin is good. Vincent D'Onofrio, Vincent, Kingpin yeah. is fantastic. Him and Charlie Cox have played these parts since 2015, which is incredible. They're still getting to do it now. I was about the experience working with them. Uh, what kind of stuff did do you feel like they brought to this that, from their experience that helped elevate the project as a whole? You know, I mean, I think, well, Vincent, uh, I mean, Vincent is kingpin, right? Mm-hmm. But but I think, I think more importantly, he's incredibly thoughtful, you know, and he puts a lot of thought and care into the character. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we talked about even before I, I met Vincent was uh, in, with the King Queen character was this idea of like it's not his strength that makes him it's it, you know his his super his super um, his ability isn't his strength it's his intellect and it's his ability to sort of like psychologically manipulate uh, uh, um, uh, people to get what he wants you know and, and I think in just my own personal research you know like there's a there's an excellent portrayal of that in, in full display like the third season of, of um, Daredevil um, there's also an excellent uh, Kingpin miniseries uh, in the comics that really kind of illustrate illustrate a lot of this and so having done all that before even meeting with Vincent and going to the conversation with Vincent, those two things, it just became an entirely yes and process. That's awesome. Each episode, or at least two and three, I don't know, I assume it might be going forward, they start with these uh, sequences that are not in the present day. There's a, a way of calling back to the cultural story that's also unfolding here as part of it. And I also see that, like, you know, Echo is first played at the Choctaw Celebration Day. I hear you guys are going to do screenings up in Quebec. Uh, and it, it's so cool to see not only see this on screen myself, but see the reactions from people and hear about how much this is meaning to people. So I love to hear, I mean, just what, what has been your favorite part of sharing this, getting the representation into the show and doing it so authentically? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because like, I think representation is always, it's just something that, it's not something I try to do. I just, I just, <laughs> you yeah. know, like I just, my, in my daily walk of life, right. you know, I don't walk around thinking like, I'm an indigenous person in the coffee bean, you know, like, no, I just go in and I get coffee. Um, and so I think, but that being said, representation is, is, isn't, it wasn't a maybe, it was a must, mm-hmm. you know, for us. And um, so I think what that meant is that we had deaf writers in front of, uh, or, sorry, in front of and behind the camera. That meant we had indigenous uh, writers in front of him. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, behind the camera, but we also had uh, deaf uh, uh, experts, ASL masters, a, uh, deaf actors, and then we also had indigenous uh, writers in the writers' room, indigenous uh, cultural experts, language experts, um, and everything in between, both in front of and behind the camera. So it's, in, it's incredibly uh, rewarding. Uh, so which episode are you most excited for everybody to see? Oh, man. Which, uh, who, uh, yeah, what is your favorite kid, right? Um, <laughs> I think I, I think I love, there, there's something to love about them all in, in various ways, you know. 
I, I'm particularly excited for people to see the third episode, which is directed by Catriona McKenzie and shot by Magdalena Gorka. Um, I think it's one of my favorite in the entire series, and I think they absolutely crushed it. Richie, I wa just watched the first three episodes of Echo tonight and this morning, so they're fresh in my nice. head, and I really enjoyed this show. That's awesome. Dude, thank you. Uh, thank you for what you guys did on this. Uh, I, I find it really interesting how the episodes all kind of start out very differently. Mm. Uh, one of the things it does first is almost like a previously on, but it's all told in this story that catches you up on what has happened in Echo, uh, Echo's story in the MCU while adding brand new, really important pieces of her story for the series. So I'd love to hear, hear about how you guys approached, you know, doing a standalone thing, but making sure no matter what people have watched, they get everything. Yeah, we really tried to, especially in the pilot, make sure that we told Maya's complete origin story, literally starting with the dawn of time, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. but, but tell her whole origin story in a way that that touched on what happened in Hawkeye, but, you know, made sure that you didn't have to watch a whole series to understand what was going on with her here. Uh, I don't know, I love our previously on, so thanks for calling them out. And, uh, and the way each episode starts is also a really cool, like, precursor to the episode mm -hmm. in a cool way, so. That's actually my next question, because the, there's, like, visual representation of the culture, the history, the everything that's going on, like, in, in Maya's lineage and her ancestors and everything, different ways of telling that story that then reflect what's coming in the episode. Why was it important to give those sort of visual uh, versions of these stories instead of just kind of laying it out there as, as dialogue or something? The story is really about Maya coming home, you know, to her family and to her culture. So to, to say that this was more than just a story about uh, a villain becoming a little, a little more than a villain, a little antihero, it was actually Maya Lopez going home to her culture in a way that she kind of turned her back on for years. So the second she enters Tamaha, she starts feeling overwhelmed with this feeling of culture and responsibility of her past and her ancestors in a way that she doesn't even understand. So for us, it was this way of saying, like, look how long this culture has stood and and uh, there's been other women in your lineage like you, Maya, that you don't even know about because you left when you were a kid. And it's kind of all just beating into her the second she gets home. Yeah, it's also the first TV AMA project from Marvel Studios. Why was Echo a good place to start with something like that, you think? Well, uh, I think as a villain, she lends herself to a more gritty and violent tone to begin with. You know, as we know about her mm -hmm. from Hawkeye, she was she was Kingpin's number two, and he taught her violence, he taught her murder, he taught her how to fight, uh, and we didn't want to shy away from that aspect of the character. So we mm -hmm. just wanted to make sure we were delivering on the promise that she was a badass, and she she wouldn't pull her punches, so we couldn't either. When Daredevil showed up? I did like the Leo, like, <laughs> oh, like I was caught off guard. I saw it in the trailer and I still was hyped. That's awesome. uh, the the red suit is there. It, can you talk about getting Charlie suited up? Is that the suit he wore before? Did you make a new one for this show? It was new. It was a brand new suit. It, it was it was a new take on the Netflix suit, which okay. was designed originally by Ryan Minerding, who's mm -hmm. our you know head of visual development for over a decade at Marvel Studios. Uh, he came in and we said we wanna we wanna honor classic Daredevil. Uh, we want to do a little bit different than Netflix just to because we get to. Uh, yeah. And Ryan came in and just kind of tweaked it a little bit. I think it's, I don't want to get too into the weeds on the suit, but uh, but I do because it's awesome. And, Ryan, and Ryan's awesome. Stuff. It's kind of yeah. closer to the She-Hulk suit, but a okay. little more red in the most blatant terms. Sure. Um, but it was our way of just trying to get quintessential Daredevil on screen in this in this sequence. Awesome. And now let's talk about Kingpin as well, because with Daredevil comes Kingpin as well. Yeah. How would you describe quintessential Kingpin? What are the core parts of that character we have to see that Vincent is bringing to life? Because he's good. In, yeah. in the parts I've seen, he's fantastic. Yeah, he's scary. And he's, so scary. He's, he's violent, and like Maya, uh, he could do so much with just a look on his face and is so intimidating, yeah. and that's awesome. But also what I think is great about him being in this show is we got to see a different side of him in terms of his emotionality mm -hmm. uh, and where he is after being humbled by Maya at the end of Hawkeye. You know, I think he's a little bit of a changed man when we meet him here. And I think it's exciting to see such a larger than life character like him can go through those changes. And you've worked on so many different Marvel projects. Uh, as it seems to be, there, there, there seems to be different lanes and pockets mm -hmm. being carved out. Kingpin could kind of be like a Thanos type. 
yeah. of villain for maybe street level New York or even maybe bigger. But that's where it seems like this could go. Do you think? Do you want to see that? Are you guys talking about? I want to see that. Of yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah no, of course. I, I think stay tuned to how this show ends and where we see him next. And uh, yeah, as a Kingpin fan myself, that sounds awesome. Oh, I know Vincent would love it. So. Let's get to Fisk Tower, man. There you Let's go. <laughs> uh, I, I really enjoy how this series sets up some uh, some really great supporting characters and relationships that build Maya as a character as well. Why was it so important to to build her world with characters and tremendous cast members who make us really sympathetic towards all these people around her? And I swear, if y'all kill everybody in these final two episodes, I'm gonna lose my mind. <laughs> no, I think that's part of the fun. <laughs> that's part of the fun. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> of these new television series for us. And part of the fun of Spotlight, right, is that we get to introduce not just Maya Lopez, but a whole new cast of characters with her. And, yeah, these characters are so much fun to spend time with. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I, if you cut off my time with them short, oh, there's gonna, I'm showing up at Marvel's. No, no I would like I'm to see kidding. them all again one day as well. Uh, 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 the last thing I want to ask is just because you have worked on so many projects, mm -hmm. and Echo is going to kick off 2024, and we just saw a sizzle reel of animation stuff last night at the at the What If yeah. uh, event. Uh, the, the schedule is changing. It's always changing, but right now it looks like they're, they're spacing things out a bit more, uh, and, and 2024 is less projects than we thought it was going to be, which seems almost like a good thing at this point. Mm. Like, we're getting to really focus on one at a time. How, can you, how, can you, how would you describe the sort of uh, the, the new schedule, the new rollout plans for some of these Marvel shows and movies and how they're going to all kind of relate to each other? It allows us an opportunity to, to, it allows us an opportunity to kind of go ideas first, find characters from the comics, whether they're established characters like Daredevil or new characters like Maya, mm -hmm. uh, and kind of get to just tell awesome stories that are tonally different from one another. So getting to tell a gritty, grounded, violent story for Maya, uh, you know, in the next couple years, we'll see something completely different with another new character from the comics. And that, to me, is the most fun part of, you know, the future of Marvel, mm -hmm. especially on the television side. But um, that's the opportunities that are being awarded to us right now is that we get to do all those different things. And like, what if, like you mentioned, can be released over nine nights over the holidays and there's this awesome multiversal animated series that is so kick-ass and big. And then we get to tell a grounded, gritty story in one night uh, with Maya Lopez. Like, getting to do those different things is the best part of the, the future. That's awesome. 